What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the History of Hyenas. I'm Chris Stefano, aka Chrissy Coffee Cakes, with my co-host, as always, Giannis Pappas, aka Yanni the Lesbian. What's up, everybody? We love you. We're thinking about you. Yeah. We hope your lives is going good, and we thank you for your service. Thank you so much for your service. Today, we got a fucking wild episode for the first time in History Hyenas history. Wow. Second time. We why? Who was our? Well, th- third we- time. Third time. What? Yeah. Well, we had no mum, but we didn't release it because it was boring. Yeah, we didn't release it because because all it was was a lot of this. <laughs> Way song she ain't. Thank you. Thank you. And then we had uh, Dan we- Saint Germain on. Yeah, that was Dan- good. That was yeah. Dan- and we had JP Burke or uh, KP, uh, KP oh, Burke. KP. Well, there was also Soul Joel, so this is the fourth time. Yeah, this yeah. Is, so it's not actually exclusive thing at all. Yes. I thought that it was. <laughs> well, it's actually, this is our first. But this is our first real guest. Because there's not too many of this. First of all, one of let's my be favorites. Honest. Okay, one yeah, of my favorites. One of my, one of my favorites, too, because yeah. let's be honest. Soul Joel was a guest, but he's fucking Franks and Beans. He listens to okay? this and he gets mad when he hears it. Yeah, and then let me just explain to the new people who are newest members of the History Hyenas. First of all, thank you for listening to the podcast for free right now. It, we, it's fine. It's no problem. You're listening, but we have a Patreon called patreon.com slash Bay Ridge Boys if you want to be a non-toot. Because right now you're listening to our content for free, which I is fine. We live in America, but you're a fucking toot. Yeah. So if you want to be a non-toot and gain our respect, then you will join the Patreon, patreon.com slash Bay Ridge Boys. And when we call someone Franks and Beans, what we mean is if you've ever seen the movie Something About Mary. It means you're fucking stupid. Yeah. Her brother, Warren. Would always go, who with special needs and walk around with a helmet, would always yell, Franklin Beans. So that's what we call people and places and things that we think are stupid. Yeah. We call them Franks and Beans. I know that's insensitive, but listen. But it's not because he was referring to Ben Stiller. So we use it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. So good call. Yeah. So and that- then when we say something wild, we have a button that our producer, Zach Isis, a.k.a. Sandra D. Yeah. S- hits this button when we say something wild. Way song she ain't. And yeah. what that means is what we've just said is it's negated a joke. now and a joke because we press that Way Shang Shein button. So you see how a lot of people out there, how you guys make the rules, how sometimes you just live in a world where it's like, oh, actions speak louder than words, but then words speak louder than actions. Well, that's what we do in here too. Yeah. We say whatever the fuck we want, yeah. and then we press a Way Shang Shein button and it all goes away. Yeah. So welcome to the fucking matriarchy. Welcome to the history of hyenas. We have our first real guest today. Yeah, and let me just say something. Go ask if you, you, you don't, we're just not asking for you to join Patreon and get nothing. You get, yeah, this isn't a GoFundMe. No, you get tons of extra podcasts, kamikaze episodes. Um, And a kamikaze episode is fucking wild because that's when one of us is recording the other and they don't know. So if they say something wild, it's going up. It's going up. For our $25 members. Guess what we just did? We just kamikaze my fiance and she's not a part of the Patreon. Oh, she's hearing this right now. I'm fucking dead. Yeah. Yeah. She is a part of the Patreon, but only for the $5 members. So she's a non-toot, but she's not a fucking pseudo penis of the week, dude. And it's my $5 that she puts on there. Yeah, so it's what it is because let's be fucking crystal clear it's a man's world it's what it is i know that it's i know that i know that it's women and everything and i have a little girl yeah but let's just be fucking crystal clear when push comes to shove yeah it's a man's world (laughs) (laughs) and that's why Um, we can't wait yeah yeah what are you doing yeah i mean he's just he's getting fucking looking at more tattoos for his fingers because the kid is just a slow dumb fucking 23 year old kid yeah he's a fucking trendy he's from queens yeah so am i let's be honest queens doesn't produce the best the brightest. No, we really don't. Like when you when the Mets were in the World Series, like when you guys remember when the Mets made it to like the second round? Yeah. And you guys were like, guys were celebrating when was that 2015, 16? Yeah. And they go, wow, we still got one more series? And then yeah. you fucking lost? And then we lost from Queen. Yeah, cuz make no mistake, the day the Mets lost. Nobody got their garbage picked up the next morning. That's what it because is. Because people were depressed. Yeah. Their fans were depressed. But we have our first guest. I want you to introduce him. Guys, we're sitting here uh, with one of mine and Chris's favorite. Truly. Truly 
favorite comedians in New York City. One of the most interesting minds, funny, boisterous personalities from out on the island. Yeah. Give it up for Tim Dillon, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yes, Tim yeah. Dillon. This this is is very, comic. This is very special. I heard the previous guests yeah. that you had, so you really curate a real lineup in here <laughs> yeah. of important people yes. that have a lot to say. So Absolutely. I we feel real, honored to yeah. be here. We really are all over the map with what we do and who we bring, yeah. bring in I'm here. I'm a resident of Queens. Yeah. I dig it. It's halfway between right. Long Island and New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, I never feel the pressure to be good looking or successful right in queens why? Yeah, there's no que pressure because no. queens is neither good looking nor successful no, it's, it's, per it's perfect yeah. it's a big airport Qu queens yeah you could <laughs> yeah, be in parts of you could be in parts of queens and you're literally in bangladesh yeah or it is yeah. the most diverse but it's not cool diverse like brooklyn and brooklyn diverse is like five white people and a mixed race person right. that's brooklyn diverse. that's brooklyn yeah queens diverse is like oh you're from nepal yeah. What even is that? Like, yeah, yeah. it's so diverse. Right. That bakeries in Queens serve things you don't even know what they are. Yeah. yeah. You go in a bakery in Queens, you try to get a cookie and you can't because it's like a it's a Romanian bakery and everything yeah. they have is made of tears. Yeah. And and cow parts. It's right. crazy. What like like in in Brooklyn, like those yeah. parts of Brooklyn, like you'll go in and yeah, diversity is some person who's like you know. Who's been in America for their family has been in America for fifty years and they're you know right. half Japanese, half black, half Eskimo. But when you go out to Queens, somebody's got his arm blown off because he just got off the boat from the Syrian refugee war. Yeah, Queens is real deal shit. Yeah. Queens yeah. is real deal. Queens is restaurants that have buffets for yeah. food that there never should be a yeah. buffet option in yeah. some of these rat like some of the restaurants you yeah. walk into in Queens, there's crabs yeah. hanging off. The yeah. buffet escaping. Yeah. It looks like another country in a lot yeah, of ways. Queens, yeah. Queens is world. harboring illegal immigrants, yeah. if yeah. we're being for being honest. Yeah. yeah, when your relatives yeah. come from the country you escape from. Many of them are city council members, <laughs> I imagine. I imagine yeah. they're running Queens. Yeah. When you come from a country where you've seek, uh, sought asylum from and your relatives sneak into the country. Yeah. It's in Queens that they're in. They're all squeezed oh, into an yeah. apartment in Queens. Nobody yeah. will notice anything in Queens. It's one of those places where you could kind of hide anybody. Right. And nobody would notice. And everybody minds their business. Yeah. Nobody absolutely. really cares about what anybody else is doing. Yeah. yeah. Everybody minds their business. There's very few places with lines around the corner for brunch in Queens. No. Nope. It's not a thing. Well, nobody a, does a story that. is getting gentry. A story, a story is a happening. A little bit. Yeah. A story a little bit, but only on Dittmar's. I live by Steinway. Yeah. So Steinway. We're the other way. There's not really a lot of... There's a little brunch here and there happening. Right. But it's pretty much just elderly people and babies. There's <laughs> yeah. not even middle-aged people in Queens. There's elderly people and little babies. That's it. That's it. Because yeah. all the middle-aged people are either working or dead. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, good That's call. That's it. Yeah. Now, me and Tim yeah. Me and Tim went on the Joker's Cruise together last year. You can't make it this year because of previous... Thing. You have you have other work things you can't miss. Yeah, but I really just canceled it because I don't want to go. <laughs> Yes, exact. Ce yes, Let's just be honest with each other you're, here. Because you're a fucking wild kid. And yeah, you're, you're a treat for humanity. Yeah, I was trying to just spit it for you. I got it. I'm just gonna be fucking open and honest. I don't want to go. The fucking fans are weird. I'm gonna get Legionnaires' disease. I don't want to lose my Wi-Fi. I got a fucking kid at home, and Big J Okerson creeps me out. He's gonna love it. <laughs> Big J is gonna. He's gonna love it. He yeah. goes every year. He was yeah. at. Was he on with us last year? Yeah. No, but he likes uh, that. Did he walk he around with one pant leg up? No, he he loves it. Yeah. He loves it. But tell the people, I wanted your perspective. Obviously, did I get Wei Shun Chien for that? Yeah, I was just, kidding. Yeah. Well, Wei Shun Chien. Well, here's the problem. I knew there was a problem because you meet at the cruise terminal. We all go, we all go into New Orleans. <laughs> yeah. And we meet at the cruise terminal. Many of the people that were taking the cruise had decided to bring food and beverages <laughs> with them. <laughs> so automatically, I knew this was Which a- Which you a, can't do, right? Well, here's the thing. You can do it in certain cases, but I knew this was a group. So bringing food and drinks on vacation with you, that's a certain type of person, yeah. you know? That's a certain type that's of a, person. Let's be honest. That's a disgusting person. Yeah, it, it's not for me. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. Not for me. So I saw people dragging coolers, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Now, we're, we're cruising into the middle of the fucking ocean, but this boat is the size of a fucking mall. It really is. So you'd imagine there'd be food on it, but these people are like, just in case that runs low, yeah. I have snacks. Yeah. So for the room, one of the, one of the ladies said to me, I swear to God, she goes, 
I had brought snacks for the room. Yeah. I said, for the room? <laughs> There's a 24-hour buffet. <laughs> Just to give you an idea, these, <laughs> these people didn't want to be caught in the room hungry. They didn't want... <laughs> Me and Giannis were talking about it. There's not... If if there's even a little space in their stomach, oh, yeah. if even a little bubble of they air... Fill <laughs> <laughs> they fill it in. They fill it in. I mean, you you see it. You it looks like you're at you looks like you're at a fair at a, watching a go kart. It looks like a go kart festival. There's just fuck, it's medieval times on the fucking boat. There's scooters everywhere. These people are huge, dude. It is. Let me tell you right now, it is crazy. At because I'm a big dude and I understand that there's it's you know there's a whole fat activist movement where people are like. You know, you should be fat, and I never was into that. I was always like, I eat too, I eat too much. I should, I should. Yeah, you're like, I eat more. so much, I can't go to sleep till four in the morning till my yeah, food it's digests. Like this is not, this is yeah. a bad thing. I'm slowly killing myself. But when I used to do cocaine for years, and I never did cocaine, and thought about starting a blog, going, everybody get fucking start doing shit up your nose. It's great. <laughs> everybody should lay in bed till four a.m. and with their throat all fucking scratched. You didn't up. feel discriminated against when someone said, "Hey, you might want to quit cocaine." No, <laughs> no. <laughs> and my like dear, you're oppressing yeah. me. Yeah, I never. So I, I, I think food is like a drug you see people on this boat that is their lifestyle yeah is glut like right. they're la- like they and they're not even and i hate to see, like they're not even fat off good food you got fat off pringles yeah and tv your tv dinner fat your arby's fat your buffet fat right like you're not you've never even had a good thing Right. They would come to New York. They would have a stroke if they ate any of this food. They'd be dead in a week. <laughs> yeah. They don't even know shit like this exists. They've never had proper tomato sauce or anything. These are Domino's people. Right. Yeah. And they're on the boat. And let me tell you right now, man, the kids are like little cinnamon buns. They're huge. The kids right. are huge. Yeah. 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 The kids are big. Yeah. The pool is the size of a postage stamp. <laughs> <laughs> There's about two or three people that can fit in this pool at once. Maybe one person and her two children, and the pool is completely full. I thought they would have a big pool, water slide. There's no water slide because everybody keeps getting stuck. You'd have to plunge them out. Um, there was a buffet 24 hours. 24 two, hours. And, the, and the boat, they want to prevent an outbreak of disease. Yeah. So when you walk into the boat- That's a nice, nice friendly reminder every time you yeah. fucking got to watch your hands. There's a Filipino guy because everybody who works on the boat lives in the Philippines. This is the fact. They're all yeah. the cruise industry yes. lives in the Philippines. Yeah. And you never see them when they're not working. They make them live in a pipe in the middle of the ship. Okay? <laughs> and then they're allowed to come out once a day. They're always working. You yeah. never see them. Being honest, talked about it. I go, you never, there's no breaks. You never see two cruise employees being like, you know, you know, remember last crew? Yeah. None of that no, shit. They're hard at they're work. They're fucking hard at work or they're gone. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where they are. Maybe they go overboard. <laughs> But you never see him. They go back to the pipe. So this one dude, he would just stand in the front of the buffet and go washy-washy. And he would spray your hands. And I'm talking about, this was not hand sanitizer. Yeah. This was like a fucking poison, like killing everything on you. Yeah. It hurt when he sprayed your hands. Like it was like fucking ammonia that you had to <laughs> rub your hands. You rubbed the layer of skin off your hands because everybody was so... They were so nervous about because it's a petri dish. They're I mean, like, we don't want these people spread because if there are cases where like eighteen hundred people get sick, yeah, oh, and yeah. then the party's over. Yeah, yeah. the Legionnaires <laughs> the disease, party. norovirus. Yeah. Well, yeah, then party's over. And what these cruise lines do? Carnival Cruise will abandon these fuckers in the middle of the ocean. They don't give a shit because none of these people are rich. <laughs> none of these people have lawyers. They know they're not doing anything. So Carnival's like. Leave them out there and shit. Sometimes there's like a the electrical grid will go down on one of these boats. And Carnival's like, whatever, just let the military of whatever country <laughs> figure it out. They don't give a shit because these people are disposable. <laughs> yeah. Carnival knows these fucks don't have lawyers. They're yeah. not going to come. This isn't a river cruise going down the Danube, you, you yeah. know? Yeah. These fuckers <laughs> are going to deal with it. It is what it is. Yeah. Half of them won't notice, you know? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's fucking. See, but that's what I'm saying. Like, that's why. No, it's bad. All it's, that stuff I got, if I'm being honest with you, what it, it, it started with. It made me make up yeah. an excuse. It started with me and Giannis sitting there. Before the thing took off, we knew. Ah, uh, yeah. You wanted we to knew. get off before it left. I didn't yes. want to be there, yeah. Like, if, if, if they would have come up to you and said, listen, you guys can get off if you want. You're not going to get paid, yeah. but you can get off. You would have got well, off. Me and Giannis are also New York cunts is kind yeah. of the term. Yeah, right. So immediately. Because a lot of people love yeah. it. A lot of our peers love it. They Let me tell you right now. They adore it. 
And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. They were born in other places. This is, I right. get it. It's exciting you know? for them because it's, of that. Yeah. It's very exciting. The boat is big. Isn't the boat big? Give me a, get me away from you yeah. and yeah. your thought process. Um, yeah. yeah. I get on the boat. Giannis gets on the boat. We start looking around and we start saying to ourselves, we're looking at all the, the mouth breathers and they have them in like a FEMA tent. They have them in a big <laughs> cruise terminal and they got their food and their potato chips. And then they all start lumbering on this thing. And we're like, it just hits us immediately. Oh, we're about to go into the middle of the ocean with these people. With Walmart. <laughs> it, and that's, that's exactly it. what it is. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. And yeah. there's nowhere to go. There's yeah. nowhere to go. And listen, it's not a tropical paradise. It's cold. Yeah. You get out in the middle of the ocean. You, you think it's like a tropical paradise. It's people wearing hoodies. It's kind of windy. Yeah. It's not that sunny. Yeah. You dock at a shitty like uh, like a fucking weird sandbar that the Royal Caribbean and Carnival Cruise bought and have turned into Costa Maya, Mexico, which doesn't fucking exist. And it's these guys that are dressed up like conquistadors and fucking pirates and these idiots, these fat idiots, they sell them jewelry. There's a 24-hour news channel in your little... And by the way, the accommodations you have, you stay in like a little... I don't know how some of those people fit in those cabins. They they don't. Yeah. They shut the door on their fat. They tuck their, <laughs> it's like the way that I fit into a jacket. They fit into the cabin. They're in the cabin. They put on a channel. The channel is 24-hour... Uh, what you can buy when you get to this island. And it's just some guy going, hey, I've been in the cruise and jewelry industry for 25 years. And you go, that's not a thing. Yeah. There is no cruise. And, and he goes, the deals you're going to get when we land in Costa Maya are amazing. And he starts showing you these shitty bracelets and shitty earrings. And then what happens is these fat people get off the boat and they go to these little jewelry stands and they're all like kiosks on yeah. a beach. Yeah. And then they, they jam these necklaces around these fat ladies' necks and they pay money and then they get back on the boat, and it is, it is a, and, and by the way, they take you, you get on, like, you get in a cab, when you go to a resort, they take great pains to disguise how fucked the rest of the area is. Yeah, this is, is the best right. part. They, they pick you up, and they take you right to the resort, they don't fuck around. When you go on a cruise, and you land in this shitty island, if you want to go to the restaurant, or the beach, or something like that, they gotta drive you through the rest of the island before you get there. So you get in this little like golf cart that seats about eight people and you drive through, I am not kidding, hellish third world hellscape <laughs> where there's guys with no <laughs> shoes chasing roosters for dinner. <laughs> and you're sitting there, you're sitting there, everybody's 400 pounds. There's people playing the xylophone on their ribs, wasting away on the side of the road. <laughs> like there's people that would kill you if they were hung, they're emaciated. They lack the strength to plunge a knife into your throat. They would if they could. Yeah, yeah. And you wouldn't blame them either. I'd be like, fuck, if I was starving and they just carted around fat people, <laughs> it is it is the craziest thing. And I just said to myself, I'm like, how? And then you start listening to people around you and they're like, well, we took Carnival last year and I'm like, oh, this is the thing that people do yeah. and they enjoy it. And it's like, I, I don't even want to be part of this. It's just such a mix because <laughs> it's so true. He says they, they like... There's this, where you dock, this little area that's just completely commercialized tourist bullshit with the conquistadors. Yeah. And then you just travel a little farther out. You're in a 10th world country. <laughs> and what we do is we just show up in this moving fucking mall <laughs> with all the food in the world on oh, the boat. Yeah. And if we yeah. just took that food and gave it to the people, yeah. they'd be happy. But we go, no, we're getting off. We're buying a keychain, And then we're getting back and on just, and taking the food away. These people think they're having a cultural experience. These fat mint people from Ohio. <laughs> while walking around eating churros, <laughs> pointing at fake, like, what do they call those statues? The, uh, uh, the, um, the, the totem poles. Yeah, totem poles. Which are, are fake. They're, they're, they're not... all fake. They were built three years ago by Royal Caribbean and Carnival Cruise Line. <laughs> yeah. And these fat idiots are like, oh, it's Mexican chocolate. They're boiling Hershey's. These fuckers don't know. And they're eating churros. And they all, and here's what's most disturbing. This is, I think, what disturbed me and Giannis the most. This is what was the most dystopian about it. Everybody thought it was great. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody enjoyed it so much that you went so crazy. You're like, am I wrong? No, you just start realizing how yeah. over we are. Yeah. You, you realize that it really is over because everyone thought it was a great time. And yeah. it was raining and cold. Yeah. And it, so, okay, because yeah. that was my question. So, like, because like, it's February right now. You guys have to say in February. Yeah. I Other than that, we had a great time. Other than that, it was fine. I understand leaving the port of dinner. I understand yeah. leaving the ports. It's going to be cold, but you're saying even when you get to Mexico, it's still cold there. I mean, listen, it here's was the rainy deal. and cold when we went to Mexico yeah, that day. I'm, I'm sure some days it's hot. For us, it was not, and I bet the weather is a lot more. You know, I don't think it's like certain what it's going to be. And you realize when you're on the cruise, you think there'd be something about the cruise that felt like beachy and tropical, but it really doesn't because you're nowhere near the water. Literally, right? You're in a building, and the water's below you. 
and the pool is the size of a postage stamp. Nobody goes in so the pool. So that's a good point. You're not even, you're on the ocean, but it's like you're in a huge, you're in a built, like a skyscraper building. Yeah. yeah. If you jumped off the boat, you'd, Dead. you'd, be, you'd die before you hit the water. Yeah. There were people. Because it's too high. Yeah. There was a guy on the boat that told us that one guy killed his wife that way. They don't have proof, but she disappeared over the side of the boat. <laughs> And he woke up the next morning like, hey, where's my wife? But at the buffet, like yeah. not really caring. Yeah. Like, where's my, you see my wife? Let's get a waffle. And then all of a sudden the FBI at the end of the cruise found out he had a huge insurance policy he took out on her everything. So he took her to the boat and just pushed her. We had a whole talk about what happens if you fall off. During the day, you might be okay because somebody might see you and they might send her. Here's the thing. They never turn that fucker around. So they'll send a rescue boat for you. And then you, the rescue boat has to just catch up to the boat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So if you fall during the day, if you fall at night, it's over and it's over quick. And here's the other thing. <laughs> It'll suck. And by the way, tons of people do it's this. too big to turn around. It'll yeah. suck you under the boat. Yeah. When you jump off, it'll suck you right under the boat sometimes, and that's it, too. You'll and just be killed by the propellers. You, yeah, that's it. I mean, yeah. this thing is a massive, I mean, it emits, I think, I think Perpetually, like like a, like a never, because it never. And it probably kills all the fish and wildlife it goes over on that like, fucking it's ocean. It's a climate. It's a fucking. It's a. It's a natural disaster. It's like those more boats. than a million cars. Yeah. Mo- it's like that amount of power that it uses. And it's just. It's just around yeah. to feed the emotional and physical needs of fat, boring yeah, people. Because people are like, you know what? I'm tired of being a pig on land. <laughs> what if we did everything we usually do, like gluttony? Sit around. I mean, there's fuckers on this thing. I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding you. There are people on this boat that lay on a chaise lounge with a bag of Ruffles potato chips in a hoodie. It's not even warm. And they just, and I and I want to sit down with this person and go, what is this? <laughs> yeah. Tell me why you're doing this and why you can't do this in your backyard. Yeah. What is the appeal of... Of doing this, it yeah. Seem, it seems like if you wanted to do, you would just go to a resort. You're just doing the same things you would be doing at a resort or like an all-inclusive resort, but in the middle of the ocean for no reason. Let me ask you a question. You've been on a boat. Yes. I've been on boats. I love being on a boat. You've been on a boat. Have you ever been on a boat and said this would be a lot better with 3,800 people? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Have you ever been on a boat and go, you know what really would be more fun if we could bring two to 3,000 strangers here yeah. and let's build a, a vessel big enough for them to shit and piss in <laughs> and eat. They got to eat two, three meals a day, two snacks. 12, me- 12, 12 meals. 12 meals a day. When you see the way and, some- and by the way, the food is a tro- I would think it's, it's not well, even edible. what do edible. you think? We're it's on a horrific. boat. Yeah. <laughs> My friend Michelle came, who's this rich bitch from L.A., who oh, I love, yeah. and I brought her because I said, she needs a culture shock because rich people don't even know this happens, yeah. okay? She, I bring her, and I get yeah, a kick out of her. what was her experience? I get a kick out of her because she's a real cunt. Like, there's, <laughs> you can't be a cunt. Like, I travel with her. Like, I'll fly to L.A. with her. She calls a stewardess over, or the flight attendant, whatever. She's like, hey, it's cold in the back of this plane. Let's figure it out. And the flight attendant looks in her eyes and realizes this is the bitch that won't shut up unless I do what she wants. Right. Yeah. Let me do it. Right. We'll walk into she's a used to a certain she's level. She's used to a certain level of that. She walks in. She says to the people at the restaurant, no, 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 we're going to sit here. And they all just do it. Everyone says, like, you catch more flies with honey than that. That's full of shit. I, my dad's a very honey guy. He gets nothing. <laughs> honey gets you shit, okay? Yeah. Vinegar, acid in someone's face gets you noticed. <laughs> that gets you fucking attention. Oh, you catch more flies. What are, you don't. Yeah. So I love Michelle. I'm like, Michelle's going to get a kick out of his fucking cruise. I didn't even know how bad the cruise was. Michelle found a VIP room for artists that we didn't know existed. Right. Where you got actual meals. Not great, but you didn't have to eat at the buffet. First night, we're all at the buffet. Then Michelle goes, I found this thing for artists. And like Joey Fatone was on the boat. This is how cruel show business was. Oh, yeah. Timberlake was doing the Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah. Joey Fatone was on a cruise with me and Luis Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is show and eating yeah. next to us. Like that like, is yeah. show business. That's show business, yeah. And uh Michelle found that little place for us, which did change the experience. We had some dinners there. It was nicer because she just she has that thing of like she was raised really rich, so she just sniffs out other rich people, right. and she's like, "Man, if I was rich, this can't be it." Like she's looking around the buffet, she's like, "This can't be it." She was right. I didn't know that. Yeah. Right. Because I'm just like, "All right, I'll take whatever's being given to me." She's like, "This can't be it." She was right. So we got like a little bit nicer 
of a situation. Did you did what did what was Michelle's like feeling of the boat? Did she feel like you guys felt she coming didn't off even it? Understand? She loves like little fun things. Like she loves comedy. She's really good friends with Big J, and she like she gets a kick out of different subcultures. She thought the whole thing was gross. She didn't. She <laughs> thought the whole thing was gross. She thought New Orleans was gross. Like she. The whole thing to her, she was just yeah. past. She loved Yana. She loved me. She loves hanging out with people. But she needs to be in the Palisades to be comfortable or yeah. Malibu. She or, likes West Hollywood. Yeah. She likes Manhattan. Yeah. She doesn't understand. You take her somewhere else, she's like, she'll do uh, South Palm. Yeah. She'll do Miami, Soho House. Yeah. Other than that, she doesn't understand what's happening. Yeah. And uh, right. she's not wrong. Here's the other thing. She's not really wrong. <laughs> I mean, that's the other problem. That's yeah. what like, it is. Yeah. I wish she was wrong. I wish I could be like, and she's so... Small minded, no. and it's like, nah, she's not. That's Go what to we, Cleveland. Yeah. Tell me. <laughs> that's <laughs> why. That's why we're cunt. That's why New Yorkers are cunts, but we're not wrong. Right. Because we're we're just right. used to better stuff. Yeah. Now let me ask you: Do you think all throughout history, Chrissy? Yes. That um, there was like, what would be the equivalent, like in Rome? What would be the equivalent to like the cruise vacation? There, because there's oh, always yeah. been there's, something. There's always been like. The people, plebeians, yeah, and then your aristocracy. There's always been the privilege I guess the, and the not. I guess the equivalent of like cruise, like people. Pompeii was like the fucking well, Hamptons. Well, no, I think like a cruise. Whoever, I think the equivalent of the cruise people. Maybe they weren't fat, but like that mindset is whoever followed Jesus at those times. Like whoever the disciples were, were just like you know, I'm so poor, right. I have nothing going on. I'm just gonna listen to this guy who says he's making you know, bread into wine and, you know, multiplying fish. So, I, I, you know, I'll look, he, this guy's a show. I guess that, maybe. Well, this is actually a good question. Like, probably people didn't use to vacation if you didn't have money. That's a yeah. new no, no, thing. Pe no, people, that's, an, that's an American well, not new thing. Vacation. In history, nobody left their village. You never right. met anybody yeah. Yeah. else. Yeah. That's why there was marriage. Like, like pe yeah. why get married? I mean, I know you're getting married, but it's just like, you didn't know the people outside your town in the 1300s. How could you get there? But no. only rich yeah. people. Pe rich people have always vacation, and we're going to segue here. Yeah. But rich people have always vacation. This this cruise type of vacation, um, yeah, economic class is a new thing post industry. Post America, yeah. and it all started in the fucking Gilded Age, where we started building skyscrapers and utilizing steel. Big yeah. money. Today we're Big bringing money. in the comedian who's probably most obsessed with the rich and wealthy. Love him. And let's talk Gilded Age. First tycoon in America was a boat guy. Literally grew up in New York City. Grew up in the harbors in New York. Nasty guy. Street fighter. Took a loan. Bought a steam ferry. Started that steam ferry, started going back between Brooklyn and New York, taking people. All of a sudden, he had a fleet of them. He had a fleet of steam ferries. He became <laughs> the guy supplying the boats to take goods all over the country. Is that Otto Kahn? No. No, this no. is Cornelius Vanderbilt. Oh, there we go. Vandy, yeah. baby. Who's a fucking pig compared to the rest of them, right? The Commodore. Uh, no, listen, Vanderbilt's family lost, in six generations, they lost all their money. Anderson Cooper's the last guy. That's it. Yeah. There's no money. Here's why. The enterprises that Vanderbilt controlled are no longer under his family's name. It's over. You lose the business, you lose the money, because the only thing left to do is spend. And those fuckers spent. They right. enjoyed tennis, country estates, boom, 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 yeah. trips to wherever, and then all of a sudden you drain the fucking, you know. But Vanderbilt was the first tycoon in America. I mean, this guy was a beast. He had the largest fleet of steam ferries in the country, and then at age 70, he sold them all. Everybody was like, he's nuts, he's retiring, this is what the cruise people thought, because they're pigs. They're like, <laughs> he's probably done. Not only, and by the way, he had outlived life expectancy at that point. Right. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, 70 years old. Yeah. Sells all his boats, and then all of a sudden- Rich people have a relaxed lifestyle. It's very stress-free that keeps them alive. Well, it is and it isn't. He was the first tycoon. This guy didn't exactly live a stress-free life, but he wasn't in a mine either. Right. Um. What he did was he realized, I, I, I did a sketch with the head of NBC Universal once, an internal sketch was only played for the company, okay? I played a cab driver. They spent like 150 grand to do this sketch to just get played at a meeting where a cab driver essentially roasted members of the NBC board. And I was, I was with the guy and I said, I had a few questions for him. I said, what do you think about Roseanne? Very simple, very quick. This guy's overseeing all of NBC Universal. Like 30 companies, the theme park, the motion, biggest movie studio in the world, NBC, all that shit. I said, what do you think about Roseanne? This was right before the premiere. He goes, that's going to be a problem for them. He goes, she's changed. It's going to be an issue. 
he was right. I was like, that guy, he said these quickly. And I asked him, I said, what's the hardest thing about being the CEO of, of a company that's the size of yours? And he said something very interesting. He goes, it is very tough to be a CEO of this type of company or any company, really, that wants to be viable because he goes, there's two things you have to do, and those two things are often at odds with each other. you got to maximize your current model. So whatever you're doing, you got to maximize it, the efficiency, the profitability, and then you have to get your company ready for what things are going to look like in five years or ten years. And you got a limited amount of resources. So if you're, if you're really killing it doing what you're doing, you can't necessarily be putting all the resources you need to in where the market's going to go in five years because what you're doing right now, part of it or all of it might be obsolete, okay? Right. Blockbuster was killing it in the late 90s. Me and my buddies were going in there renting every WrestleMania and everything. They were not putting any fucking money and resources into where the market was going to go. Vanderbilt sold his fucking steam ferries because he said the reality is railroads. The country's coming together. It was post-Civil War. People were kind of over. Yeah. They, they lost trust in their political leaders. They were actually looking yeah. to these business leaders, to people to kind of de facto lead yeah. the country. These guys were the first titans or entrepreneurs of their kind. The country was completely unregulated. It was the Wild West. These yeah. industries were literally being born. And Vanderbilt was a guy. He started buying up train tracks, and he became the largest owner of um, railroads in the country. Okay? He was the guy. So he went from steamships to railroads. But he started. He made his money in steamships. Re his money reinvested in steamships, it into, into reinvested railroads. Reinvested into railroads. railroads and he, he had goes, the Asians and the Irish come over and start building the railroads. Yeah, he goes, listen, the reality is the country, it's not enough to take people on a boat somewhere. We need to connect the entire country. Right. Okay? And then eventually people started, you know, you can't be at the top for long. People started to fuck with them. Uh, a, a rival railroad company started to fuck with them. And they were like, listen... They started to infringe on his territory, so he just shut down the Albany Bridge going into New York City. He goes, good, no one's going to go into New York. Now, this this age brought in a new type of tycoon. Yeah, this is- Because we, yeah. like, we have, like, the previous aristocracies from yeah. previous time periods. We got bankers. We got the sure. Rothschilds. Absolutely. These were industrial capitalists. These were industrial capitalists. This was the Industrial Revolution. These were guys that didn't know any- They, they were ruthlessly competitive and brutal- and they were forging their way in this country with no real blueprint for how to do it because it hadn't been done before. So they would kind of use everything at their disposal. I mean, this guy shut down the Albany Bridge into New York City and he bled his competitors dry because they could no longer ship goods into New York. And then their stock dipped. And when it dipped low enough, he bought out their company. He invented the hostile takeover, right. which is I'm going to drive your stock down, come in and buy it all up. You now work for me. This was the first really modern tycoon. Sick. Vanderbilt's a gangster. He had two sons. One of them he loved. I forget that guy's name. And the other one we'll call Cuck. <laughs> the one he loved dies, as many of the good ones do. So now he has Cuck Vanderbilt. He's yeah. very depressed about this. He had his one golden son that he was going to hand everything to. And then you have Cuck. You know, Cuck is fine. Whatever, maybe Cuck wants to do an open mic and talk about what <laughs> yeah. it's like. Yeah, my dad sex that fall, but yeah, it's not easy for me. Whatever. Yeah. So the, the good one dies. You know, Vanderbilt's only left with Cuck. So now he's got Cuck negotiating for him, which is not going well. And because Vanderbilt knows he can't really depend on this guy. So Vanderbilt ends up getting fleeced um, out of a decent amount of money. I think it was like $7 million. These two guys, uh, Gould and Frisk, these two guys sold water down stock to Vanderbilt. He was in this other hostile takeover type situation. They got all this stock that was like watered down. They sold it to him. It was this trick. Highly, um, I don't know, at the time it was not illegal. Now it certainly would be illegal. But it was kind of public the way that they fleeced him. Because his greed got the better of him. He's just like, we're going to buy up all this stock. He bought it. And um, they would gotten the better of him. They were in the news. And he's an old guy at this point. He's like an old guy. And people were like, this guy's done. So that's when Vanderbilt said, I need to figure out a way to use my railroads to transport something else to even get to the next level. And that's when he found Andrew Carnegie and steel. Right. And he goes, I'm going to start shipping steel and we're going to start replacing the railroad tracks with steel. And he went into that thing. So those types of guys, whether it's Carnegie, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, and I mean, in, in, in today's money, Rockefeller was worth $336 billion. Uh, Carnegie, three hundred and seventy-two billion. Vanderbilt, one hundred eighty-five billion. Vanderbilt built Grand Central Station in New York City. It was completed in eighteen seventy-one as a physical monument to his power. It united three railroad lines, like the Union, the Central, the Harlem, 
all the Hudson, the Central, the Harlem. Grand Central is still probably our most impressive building. It really is. Yeah, and they probably built, our 1871, our most impressive building. They also all built huge mansions, huge mansions, and in a lot certain of the, parts of the country, New yeah, York. They all New had York, New York big, by the Hudson River. Some yeah. of them up by Central Park, and a lot of them donate a lot of their money. Um, philanthropy was a legacy that they left as. But you got to remember these guys like J.P. Morgan. They had more. They had more money. J.P. Morgan bailed out the federal government a few times. I mean, these guys had so much power. Um, nobody now, Bezos, nobody really has nearly the power that these guys did. They're, they're getting there. Yeah. They're on their way. But these guys, so I don't want to present like a one-sided thing. It was all roses. It but, was but very you, brutal. It was what, very brutal, especially for workers who had very, very little protections. Oh, and, you didn't paint a rosy picture. Okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, these guys are vicious. Yeah. But the reality is these guys exist no matter what, yeah. guys like this that exist, yeah. they're going to exist. And but here's but there's yeah. a parallel now. They, yeah, they, I think a lot they existed a lot because of the time. Like you said, these yeah. were the first guys. They yeah. were building a country. Absolutely, they were indus- the country got industrialized. Yeah. They were building it. Urban areas were flourishing. Yes, they were putting huge buildings up. This yeah. was the Gilded Age, biggest period of expansion in America's history. Yeah, yeah. and now. I think you can. The only comparable time to that is sort of the digital orgy that's going on. These new yeah. companies. This yeah. is the first. We we haven't seen yeah. a Bezos's and, and, absolutely and Bill Gates absolutely and, and Tim also, Cooks absolutely it's the same. These these are, this is a new wave of these type the of gov- tycoons. The government is sort of deferential to these tech guys in a weird way, in yeah. the same way that it was kind of deferential to these. Isn't that fucking fascinating? Yeah. It wow. is interesting. Yeah. yeah, because the government kind of understands that these guys know something that the government really doesn't know, mm-hmm. and these guys are kind of the guardians of like the new frontier. So the government is you know regulates these guys, but nowhere near with the tenacity that they should. Because the government needs these guys. The government needs to go to these guys and the FBI and like unlock this phone or help us trace this or help us get. So the, the reality is these industry people in, in tech, just like in Giannis is absolutely right. They are insanely powerful and really important. And the government kind of tap dances around them. And now I think since the election and since a lot of the stuff that happened the government is now trying to regulate them more because they realize that, like, yeah, why couldn't Russia, China, or any country invade social media and disseminate false information and drive a country crazy? I mean, it's such an easy, it's such an interesting type of warfare. This, you know, what, you know, cyber crime, all of these things that we should have been years ago, we should have been pouring money in the cyber security and all these things. And we weren't. Because we're all still about fighting conventional wars and big yeah. navy fleets, but and then like you know, twenty Russian trolls in a room can do a hell of a lot of damage by yeah. just disseminating information that's untrue and having people kind of lose their minds. That's what they've been doing. But it is interesting when you look at it that for the first time since the Gilded Age, yeah, we have this group of powerful, yeah, industry professionals who yeah. are who have made these companies into empires yes and they have that same influence yeah that that the that the industrial capitalists yeah, and have they're kind of gurus they're kind of gurus and they're it's kind crazy. of like yeah and you know it's crazy though that we had the gilded age yeah. now this fuck the gilded age was like that was a good time to be an american well jazz yeah, yeah. booze a women were starting was, to well, fuck time to be a white american uh, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but yeah. even no even the black communities uh, segregation was uh, yeah, they were thriving as well it was a good well. time for everybody they were thriving well, I mean, in certain everyone, places not, everyone's not, always a rough word but yeah, not a, lot, lot, yeah. a lot a lot uh, yeah. a lot definitely yeah. a good time to be white you're right Hey, great time to be a Vandy. Yeah. If you're yeah. a Vanderbilt, it was it was great time. Fucking killing it. But then a fucking it. bust came. That's what it I'm saying. Comes. Like, it comes. It comes. The bust comes. This was the first time women started fucking, too, and dressing like... Yeah. They would go to those speakeasies. Flappers. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Flappers yeah. started coming get around. banged they, out. They start, women started to get fucking banged out. Yeah. Cut, women didn't even know like how to come till like 13 months ago. Right. Yeah. It's kind of wild when you think about it. Yeah. It's women might take over the world because they're just getting in touch with like how to they're come. They're just getting started. Yeah, they're just getting started. Yeah. Yas Queen Yas. Yeah. It, it, it was a crazy time, but like all times, came to an end. Yeah. yeah. Came to an end, and then it was like, well, what are we going to do? And I think what is happening is there will be an equivalent come to an end of this technology thing, yeah. too, when it gives us the real tools to kill ourselves. Right. And it's giving, them, we're, it's giving us the tools to do some real permanent damage 
to our collective psyche. Yeah. Right. It's we're gonna do it. Yeah. I don't know if it's five years, ten years. I don't know when it's happening. But we, you look at AI. You look at all these things that are that are happening. And our ability to process information now is completely. I mean, you show somebody one video now, and you have two people that have two completely different reactions to it because they've been conditioned through social media to have this fucking weird uh, filter on everything. It's kind of scary. So you you walk that out. Pokemon Go terrified me. I saw <laughs> dudes running around Central Park in suits, yeah, yeah. chasing imaginary cartoons. I know that was sick, bro. I was like, this is fucking insane. Number one, who has the time? Yeah. Who has the time? What you have? If you have five minutes alone in New York City and you're in the park, enjoy the fucking park. Don't chase an imaginary lizard. Um, secondly, that was the week we were at war with North Korea, or we were about to like. We were, I was like, I saw people running. I'm like. Did we fucking, is it it? Are we under attack? And it's like, no, it's a squirtle. And it's people <laughs> running around. And I'm like, oh, this is, once augmented reality takes hold, you're going to see people in the middle of the street, fake sword fighting. Yeah. They're going to go into their own world, dude. Yeah, it's you... coming. They're going into their own world. They're not going to live in the real world. The real world is tough. The real world's a basement apartment, a liberal arts degree, no money, credit cards are maxed out, parents hate you, no health insurance. The augmented reality is you're in Game of Thrones and you're a knight yeah. <laughs> yeah. and you're fighting an imaginary thing. So that's the type of shit where that started to scare me. I would be sitting in an Uber and the Uber driver would be like, ping, ping. And I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? And they're catching Pokemon. So that type of yeah. shit is like, oh, this, this public can be controlled real easily. Right. Yeah. And it could go to a real dark place. And I think that's probably maybe where it's potentially headed. When did where did yeah, your obsession I, with the rich start? I mean, you live in Long Island, so some of your friends are rich, some of them aren't. You could drive three towns away and see mansions. You understand class right. in an interesting way. When you grow up in other areas, I went to a Catholic school. I had friends from maybe 40 towns in Long Island. So your friends ranged from like, my one of my buddies lived next to Vinny Testaverde in Oyster Bay Cove and had a four and a half acre home one of my friends lived in a bungalow in freeport long island by the bay and his parents would like sleep on the floor and let me ask you this we always out. talk about like those yeah. people like yeah they look at do they look at like borough people as like trap like they no, look, is I mean, it like listen, do they want to be like just as far away from poor people as possible they don't even have that they're number one they've never been around poor people <laughs> right here's the thing there's I, I think one of the things that i learned about rich people as I kind of studied them. And I don't mean rich like you own a BMW. I mean rich like your family's been rich for a very, very long time. Right. You've been able to maintain that level of... One thing I learned about them is there's a simplicity to them that's kind of interesting. It's actually not... They don't know any other way, many of them. they There's a great quote from S. Scott Fitzgerald where he says, the rich are not like you and me. They are soft where we are hard and they are cynical where we are trusting. That's a very interesting explanation of them. Kind of sums them up. They're soft where we are hard. They've never been on a public bus. Many of them yeah. have never been punched in the face. Yeah. They've never been on the subway when it's freezing and it's shitty and it stops in a tunnel and it's dark. Some of them have. I'm generalizing. but And and so there's a softness to them where Giannis right. is like, do they want to be around poor people? It's like, no, but then they also don't even know what that would be. Right, right. The other thing is like they're cynical where we are trusting. They're keenly aware that people want them for the things they have. So if you go start a conversation with them, they're aware, they're like, "Why do you want to be my friend? Why do you want to marry me? Date me? Whatever." I have to keep my guard up at all times because I have these things that other people will want to take. Right. And they interface with the world in a different way than we do. They're kind of skeptical of people first. Right. And you have to really kind of prove your loyalty. And that's the thing, but it is simple. I've talked to some of these people. You would imagine they're actually not the – the Vanderbilts are very rare. The tycoons are very rare. Most of these people just fall in line. Right. The Bezoses and the, the true visionaries, right. the guys that create wealth that eight generations after them live off of, are incredibly gifted and rare. And, yes, sociopaths, dictators, whatever. Right. I mean, these people really – you know, the, the thing that's scary about the tech people is they're cultists. They believe they're ushering in the new world, which will come with a new morality and a new way to communicate. And it'll, it'll, they'll define speech. Like, these are people that have a tremendous amount of power of, over how we live. Right. And they have no, and when you hear them talk, you're like, oh, you're utopians. You think you can create kind of this perfect world. Um, 
But a lot of rich people just fall in line. Right. They fall in line. Right. And they do so because falling on one side of the line is money and history and family. And on the other side of the line is good luck. <laughs> yeah. And good luck. And our friend Dan Soda dated a rich girl. And he was like, I wonder if we'll ever end up together. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was opening for him. Many people don't want their feature to act like me. But, you know, that's why I've done the three feature sets in my life. But uh, he goes, will it work? And I said, no, because you're a great guy. But on one line is you, and on the other line is everything she's ever known, all of her friends, all of her family, all, all of the security in the world. And on the other side is you. Even you, if you're on TV and you're a successful comedian, cares? it's like low to them. It's like, yeah. They don't know it's what that not is. Not only yeah. is it not low to them, but it's yeah. like this. You're going you're gonna to take a real chance. You're going to really roll the dice here if you marry this guy. You're going to roll the dice. And listen. Some people make a lot of money rolling the dice. Some people lose it all <laughs> yeah. rolling the dice. Yeah. So I think rich people, they tend to not be as interesting as I'd like to make them out to be. Yeah, They're not as loud and as eccentric. I mean, some of them are. Some of them are crazy. But I think a lot of them simply fall in line. A lot of them are passionless. Right. When you meet them, they're passionless. They're kind of bored. They've right. been everywhere. They've been to every continent. They've done it all. They're understated. They're somewhat bored. Certainly the WASP aesthetic, the old school. This is somewhat changing with the tech people. A lot of global capital is coming in all these big cities. And, you know, WASPs are being pushed out. The WASPs are kind of done. The Chinese are taking over. The Chinese yeah. are taking over. I mean, I look at the top real estate, you know, values. They, Fifth Avenue and Kensington Gardens in London, the, those two streets used to always flip-flop for number one. Now it's Pollock's Path. It's called the Peak in Hong Kong. Have the highest uh, real estate value per square really? foot. Really? Yeah. Yeah, we're done. We're done. We're, we're done. I mean, yeah, the, the Chinese numbers, are taking over. The numbers are behind that we're done. The wasps are getting pushed out. I mean, They're you all, go look at what, yeah. what the Chinese are majoring in, even here and over there. It's all engineering, oh, math, science. STEM. Then, yeah, you ask a, an, a, an American student, they're like, I'm an English major. It's like, so you're majoring in the language you learned at four. And a lot of these, <laughs> yeah. That's right. how we're going to beat the Chinese. <laughs> yeah. 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 And a lot of these emerging market countries, Kazakhstan and things like that, the natural gas business, they are the gilded age of America. They're completely unregulated. People are making hundreds of millions of dollars in these emerging businesses that are completely unregulated. You can't make that kind of money in France. And it's very hard to make it in America because yeah. there's all these regulations and taxes and rules. But in places like Kazakhstan and countries like that, it is literally the Wild West. You can make a ton of money. And a lot of these people are now coming into cities like London, New York, and everything. They're investing in real estate. You know, these are the next generation of Gilded Age people, yeah. not only tech people, but people from all over the world yeah. who are getting a taste of, of, of big, uh, you know, money in the way that we've had for a while. Yeah, well, the Chinese just come in and buy real estate, and they yeah. don't even live there. It's just, just yeah. they just want to own it. Well, they want to they want to yeah. hide their money from taxes. Yeah, and it's a culture about education. Cultures do yeah. really well when they're about education. You yeah. know, school, well, learning, and not following your dream in life. Following well, your dream is for uh, white people <laughs> who are idiots. That's what, and I mean, literally, we we've all done it, and it's worked out. To, you know, which is lovely. But the majority, the, the idea that you would go and tell my grandfather who came off a boat from Ireland. What the idea that somebody would sit down and go, what do you want to do, is insane. Yeah. It's, I know very successful West Indians who came to this country and became home health aides because somebody had come to the country and said, it pays 80 grand a year. Yeah, but you have to wipe someone's ass. Yeah, but it pays 80 grand a year. I have to survive, yeah. It is yeah. what it is. Okay, yeah. It's not a glamorous job. Yeah. And that's I also, why, that's yeah. why we're clearly at a peak. And I know we're people- We're clearly oh, summoning. Yeah. Yeah. People now like, <laughs> I want to make 17 grand a year working for BuzzFeed because yeah. I want to be excited yeah. and inspired. <laughs> I want to walk into work every day and change everything. Yeah. Ah! And it's like, oh, that's a sure route to poverty. And it's a function yeah. of just being privileged, lazy- Fucking white people. It's a man. That's it. That's yeah. Well, even even yeah. the whole thing. It's like yeah. it's like you're. You know what I mean? Like you're so fucking interesting and you're so funny. Yeah. And but because you haven't mentioned you're gay yet, it's like yeah. you don't want a comedy special. You know what right, I mean? It's like right, one of those right. things. It's yeah. like it's like you're you're literally the perfect guy that we would love to fucking watch your comedy all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not gonna and get you, it. And you want right. because you're funny and interesting. <laughs> just yeah. really so it's the Twilight Zone. Right. It just really hit me what that's about. Yeah. In this moment, you know yeah. what it really is about. This kind of this uh, this milieu now of like knowing what the person's story is yeah, yeah, over yeah. there. We don't celebrate excellence the way we used to. Right. No. It used to not matter what the package was. Right. Yeah. You know, 
we have our sordid history with race, of course, blah, 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 blah. But you see, even with the Jack Johnsons, even with the uh, John Coltrane's, whoever you wanted, uh, Prince, people could supersede their second-class citizenship in America because we did have a race problem like a lot of countries do, and, and, and European imperialism, all that. But the thing that was uniquely American was a celebration of excellence yeah. that could shoot you to the top no matter what. Jim Jack Johnson was driving Rolls Royces. We're going to do an episode on Jack Johnson. Banging white women and wearing fur coats at a time where black dudes were like, you could not do that. Right. And people kind of, he was such a great boxer and he was making people so much money that like in America it could still happen. Right. So it's like we... Do not celebrate. Ex so when you see that in comedy, it's like, I want to hear her perspective. Yeah. It's like, we, we don't want to listen to her because she's great at being a comedian. She's been toiling at it for 10 or and 20 years. And we've also years. become a boring country. You watch the Super Bowl commercials. You watch the award shows. The public sphere in this country is really boring. It's very bland. Well, that's because it's we don't... consumerist. Buy sneakers. Buy this. Buy that. There's no true interesting exploration of anything deeper or metaphysical right. anymore. There's no humor. We've become a deeply unfunny country, but at the same time, also a joke. It's like a weird, yeah. we're like a joke to the rest of the world. We're being, our, our, you know, our president's a game show host. Yeah. But we're deeply unfunny and we're deeply uninteresting. And you watch late night television, and you have all the hosts are playing with Muppets. Yeah. And if this isn't the end, man, it should be. Man, it should be. If this isn't an empire in the death throes, I don't know what it would look like. If late night entertainment is a grown man playing the the uh, checkers with Muppets yeah. and singing sing-alongs in the car. Yeah. Sing-alongs in the car yeah. is a fucking thing that people share. They go, look, you got to see this yeah this guy's gonna sing it's, with someone in the car yeah it's karaoke and you're singing in a car yeah can you imagine we went from coltrane to sing along in the car with yeah. a celebrity i just picture I, I just picture the tonight yeah. show's writing staff yeah it's just like a bunch of seven-year-olds sitting around with crayons seven-year-olds <laughs> would do a better show yeah. it's 47 year olds with crayons yeah, yeah. So, wow yeah it's it's um it's an interesting thing now, the Gilded Age, do you think that was America's peak, do you think? Well, no, I don't think it was America's peak. What I think the Gilded Age laid the groundwork for economically and culturally was the idea of exceptionalism, that there are people that can do things right. truly amazingly, and those people are a certain breed of people, and those people have to be regulated and constrained, and we, have, we need to have a government that doesn't allow those people to trample on everybody else. But you need to recognize talent. And what Marxists and people don't understand and people that tend to think the world is all about, you know, these power dynamics that are completely, um, you know, that talent and all of these things are irrelevant. No, there are genuinely... Well, equality of, eco the equality yeah, of outcomes. Right. Yeah. Genuinely talented people that are visionaries but need to be regulated and need to be constrained, but you need their spirit because otherwise, what are we all doing on the fucking planet? If you're not getting up every day believing that something is possible, whether it's a family, whether it's a small thing, doesn't have to be building a railroad, but you need to have that spirit. And if you destroy that spirit, then you enter this weird nihilistic thing where nothing matters and why do anything? And that's kind of where we are now where we're in the death throes where nobody wants to believe in anything. So I don't think it was the peak of America, but what, what it laid the groundwork for was what the country would eventually be defined by, which is the idea that if you really commit yourself to something with a insane and almost irrational fervor, you can make it happen. And that is what I think defines America. If you're really, really driven, you can make things happen but it's going to be ugly and it's going to be a brutal process. So he was a visionary with the railroads. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, these nobody guys, else was thinking that way. Was it more like, listen, there's the probably Thomas Edison, there's Tesla 10, thing or? people thinking it and then yeah. go, you know what? But I want a sandwich. Right. I want right. to go to the saloon. Right. Let me go to the saloon and talk to my friends about, I bring it up yeah. because w when you look at uh, just a parallel, like Tesla and Thomas Edison, it's come out now that Thomas Edison was just a little more ruthless with it. Yeah, but so it was Tesla's be, ideas. Yeah. yeah. We all know the funniest guy in the world that goes up and does a set once a month, walks out of the thing, we never see him again. We go, that guy was one of the funniest people in the world. What separates him from people that make a career out of it? Tenacity, yeah. right. drive, 
right. all of those the things. The business part of the show. The business part of it. The idea that we're just a little sicker. That we go back. Yeah. Cornelius Vanderbilt was just a little more broken. He had his face mashed in the New York Harbor. He was poor. Rockefeller grew up. His dad absconded and left them. Carnegie started working at 12 or 13. They knew hardship. They knew what it was like to be poor. And by the way, this isn't to say that once they got rich, they had a lot of, you know, uh, feelings for the poor. I don't know that they did. I think they got to where they got through really ruthless, brutal, pure competition. It was pure competition back then. It was just banging heads together, all and any means at your disposal. And now we live in a kinder and nicer society, but we, we can't forget that those things are a part of us. Competition's a part of us. Nature is a part of us. We can't get rid of it. We can't legislate it away from us. We're competitive beasts. We want to go head to head. We want to win. That level of competition helps us. It shouldn't be as brutal and as ruthless. No, it should you be. You just kinder. gotta have rules for the game. You gotta have rules for the game, yeah. but there needs to be a game. Yeah. And that's part of the problem now is that everybody's like, well, there doesn't need to be a game, and it's like, no, there does because. People are incentivized and motivated. Yeah. You can't by, celebrate someone who comes in eighth place in the sport. You just you they just they're not good at it. You can't. You can't give a trophy you to can't. that kid. You can't. You can't say everything's okay. You can't. You just can't anymore. And then you know people sometimes have to suck. There has to be losers. You need to kill large amounts of people. Yes. You yeah. know, that's the, the come on, yeah. You know. Yeah. But I mean, listen, it is it is one of those things where these these fuckers were not playing around. And I know some dudes, like I, I know some people that know some people. I don't know them personally, but I know some of these bigger hedge fund, whatever. I know people that are in their orbit and around them. And those guys are guys that at the end of the day, they get up every day, every minute of their day is spent trying to beat someone else. Right. That's it. And that's, and that's how you get ahead, especially in this country. That's how those guys get ahead. Like, you have to get up. Somebody's, there's 20 comedians getting off a bus coming into New York that will work harder than 20 guys right now that our careers are staggering. And right. one guy who wants to beat everybody, Nate Bargatze. Yeah, yeah. he is. He's he is. a competitive fucker. He yeah. is, and he's doing great. Yeah. And so there's something to be said for that. You can't bread competition out of us. No, no it's know? in us. It's were in these Nate. guys competitive with each other? You think Vanderbilt? Yeah, oh, yeah. Because they oh, were... Yeah. And, uh, and Rockefeller embarrassed Vanderbilt's mentor. I think his name was Tom Scott. And uh, no, I'm sorry, Carnegie's mentor. Carnegie's mentor was Tom Scott. Rockefeller embarrassed him, um, or maybe it wasn't Tom Scott, but whoever it was. And Carnegie didn't forget that they were incredibly competitive with each other. Everybody wanted to be the top dog. Rockefeller ended up kind of being the top dog, but then Carnegie was the top dog for a while. JP Moore. I mean, listen, this whole the whole history of America is cycles of newer money replacing older money. They wouldn't let JP Morgan in the Knickerbocker Club. It was this private elite club that's still on Fifth Avenue. Yeah. They wouldn't let him in because he's a fat, obnoxious, you know, think me, think Bobby Kelly, but with money and success. Mm-hmm. Like a nasty billionaire version of either one of us. We're not gonna get let into the private club. Yeah. He started his own club called the Metropolitan Club right across the street and said, fuck you, and brought his goons yeah. right. in there. It's a it's cycles of people going fuck you. I'm here now, and I'm gonna push you out. That's kind of what it's always been, and now it's done with a lot more lawyering and a lot less straight up thuggery. But there's still a lot of thuggery, and that's kind of what it's always gonna be. It's huh. not gonna be anything different than that. Even in these socialist communist countries, there are still these beast dudes, and they end up running things. You know what I mean? Well, run, the, the Vladimir system, Putin, like, yeah. who's Vladimir Putin? Vladimir Putin's a guy that rose to the top of a, a, a hierarchy. He rose to the top because he's a ruthless, uncompromising, stone-cold killer. Yeah. Okay? That's the people that are going to rise to the top of those hierarchies no matter what they are. Right. right. Now, in conclusion... Alexandria Casio cortez by the way, is one of those people, too. <laughs> I'm telling you that. Now, I, I'm, Wait, I'm not but saying she loves. She she believes people should have a livable wage, and she's not wrong on a lot of the things she believes. By the way, but what I'm saying is she's a lot smarter than people give her credit for. And yeah. the way the right wing is choosing to go at her, mistake, is so stupid, stupid, so bad. They're making she'll a martyr the, out of her. Yeah, she'll be the president in eight years. Yeah. I said the same fucking thing. President, yeah. in eight she's going to be the president. Yeah, because guess what? What's her thing? We're going to tax people that make more than ten million seventy percent. Everyone's for that. Everyone is for. Soaking the rich, ten million a year. There's so much criminality. There's a separate set of rules. 
everyone is kind of for that. The Republicans are trying to shame her and go with her. She's going to be the president in eight years. Big mistake. You heard it here first in history. Fuck hyenas. yeah. In go conclusion, wait, I just want to say, right. in conclusion, yeah. what was the downfall of the Vanderbilts? And then we'll end on that. Well, the downfall of the Vanderbilts was that they didn't have any Corneliuses anymore. It was just six generations of people without the real... So they didn't plan for where the market was going. Yeah, they didn't have a visionary out. guy. Yeah. They didn't have a guy. They just kind of, just you know, ended in Anderson Cooper. It was just... A, yeah. It was and just and a, now he lives in a firehouse. Yeah. It was a pool of money that just, you know, got smaller and smaller and smaller. And then Gloria Vanderbilt had Anderson Cooper. Anderson Cooper just, you know, fucks dudes in a firehouse and turns yeah. his back on, uh, you know, Kathy Griffin. And, yeah, you and, know, and he's on that. Watch What Happens Live tomorrow with Andy Cohen. But yeah. let's be honest. From like, Cornelius to Andy. What a journey. <laughs> Well, there you have it. There you go. The Vanderbilts, the Gilded Age, History Hyenas. Really, this is our first two a weeks. We're going two a week. Um, so you were actually the first of our two weeks. Oh, yeah. wow. Because now Thank we're going you. twice a week. Two first. So you were an inaugural I appreciate guest. it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Tim J. Yeah. Dillon on Instagram and Twitter, yes. D-I-L-L-O-N. And listen to the podcast. Yeah, Tim Dillon's going to hell. We have a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And find, there's going to be more bonus shit from us at patreon.com slash Bay Ridge Boys. Join the matriarchy. Let's suck some dicks. Yeah.